so I think we'll um, make a start. Um, welcome everybody um, to tonight's panel discussion. Um, oh, we're just going to start with Catherine, who's just going to uh, share the running order with us. Great, so welcome. Um, we're going to have a little bit of time with each of our panel guests um, and then save the Q&As for the end. So you can either drop those in the questions box um, or save them to the end and we'll get round to those. So we're going to kick off with Lael, somebody who needs very little introduction, but is the inspiration and the idea person behind the Kamut Women's Rallies, which is super awesome. He's going to tell us a little bit more about um, the Montana Slovakias event, which is coming up super soon. Then we're going to move on to Phoebe, who, um, besides being a doctor, is also like a multidiscipline racer and bike packer and has got loads of practical tips from a medical perspective under her belt, which I'm sure she'll be keen to share. Then we're going to move on to Nick, or maybe the opposite way around. I'm trying to think of the slides. <laughs> um, Nick and Vera. So Nick is one of the founding members of the New Forest Off-Road Club, if you haven't heard of it. Um, I'm sure most of you will down in the south of England, which is a phenomenal club um, with a really, really great ethos that I'm sure Nick will tell you a lot more about. And Nick was a rider on the Women's Torino Nice Rally this year, or last September at least. Um, and we'll also have some really top tips in terms of products and things that are really handy for um, general hygiene, feminine hygiene um, when you're on the trail. We're going to wrap up with Vera, who was an ultra distance scholarship uh, alumni from last year and is now helping coach the uh, cohort for this year. Vera rode a hugely impressive um, pan-Celtic race last year and has done loads of other bits of bikepacking, has some really handy tips to share and I think we all have some quite funny stories as well, um, both positive and negative. You, it's the sort of thing that you tend to learn from um, as you go along. So if you wouldn't mind flicking on Gabby. Um, cool, thanks Catherine. Um, so I'll just um, tell everyone a tiny bit about myself and a little bit about how the webinar will run. Um, so I, I'm Gabby and I um, am the Global Community Manager at Komoot. Um, and with my job, but also just in my free time, I'm also always out on my bike. Um, I started out riding on the road and then I discovered how much fun it is when you actually start exploring more and more when where the tarmac ends. Um, the picture actually at the top is from the Torino Nice Rally, which um, we did last September. Lael actually came to me with the idea a couple of months before and um, we somehow managed to pull everything together. And then we found ourselves out on this really, really incredible route with 30 really, really amazing women. So it was like a super, super special week. Um, the photo on the right was actually a trip I did with my friend Sammy and we rode from uh, Chamonix to Milan and as you can see sometimes you do have to really carry your bike on this trip we really carried our bike a lot um, <laughs> and then the bottom picture is me and my daughter actually just a week ago um, and we rode together uh, to her ski club so yeah always trying to do as much as possible uh, outside and on the bike. Um, for the webinar, um, there's a couple of different ways that you can communicate with us this evening. There's the chat box, which loads of people are already uh, using and chatting away in. Um, if you type in there, everyone can see your comments. You can ask questions. You can talk to each other. You can talk to us. You can really use it as you like. Um, and there's also a dedicated Q&A box. So if there's something that you really want to ask someone on the panel this evening, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. And at the end, we're trying... Uh, make sure we answer as many of, of your questions as possible. Cool. And with me is Catherine. Hello. So um, I thought I'd just put together a few pictures of things that sprung to mind when I thought about staying healthy and particularly feminine health um, on the bike. I was really lucky to do um, a bit of research into bikepacking on your period a couple of years ago. Um, which you can find on bikepacking.com and asking a really broad spectrum of women from all over the world who are into bikepacking what their particular, um, I want to say coping strategies, but that makes it sound like it's a really bad thing. <laughs> um, well, how, how they managed bikepacking or just riding with a period. So there's some really cool um, different ideas on there. Um, my not so uh, secret weapon, 
<laughs> is a menstrual cup. Feel free to ask me about that anytime. I'm a mad believer and only actually started using one after going on a women's sportive and getting chatting to a couple of friends who are like, haven't you tried it? You should try it. Now it's like, yeah, years passed and absolutely love it. Um, picture there of me doing all my laundry. I'm definitely more of a tourer than a racer. Um, and I definitely believe in having more than one pair of bib shorts on a ride, um, as long as, as well as you can probably see all sorts there. That was from Gather in the Pyrenees um, a couple of years ago uh, with dresses and all sorts, <laughs> touring in style. And a little picture of me in my sleeping bag to remind myself to never sleep in my bib shorts ever again. Because that's the sort of thing that you only do once and you learn the hard way. <laughs> So um, let's move on to Leo. Yeah, super. I'm uh, Leo Wilcox. I'm from Alaska and now living in Tucson, Arizona. I started bikepacking in 2008, started racing in 2015 and have been doing a combination since. And I'm just, I love spending time on my bike in any capacity. And I love the combination of racing, touring, and then creating events for women and girls to get more people out on bikes because that's really inspiring for me. I feel like with this kind of talk of management and health on the bike, uh, there are so many different ways to approach this, but you know, take the ideas that work for you, go out and test them out and then um, kind of keep evolving your system as you go. But the main thing is don't be intimidated because things will go wrong. There will be funny stories um, and it won't be the end of the world. You'll just be like, next time I would do this, or I would bring that, or I wouldn't bring that. And that's all part of it. That's all part of learning. I really feel like once you've ridden for about a week, you know most of what you want. And then after that, it's just kind of tweaking the little things that help you along the way and maybe changing that year to year too. Um, let's see, I'm super excited about these women's bikepacking challenges. As Gabby said, our first one was last September for the Torino Nice Rally. This has been a dream of mine for a long time. I've done group starts on different routes like the Baja Divide, but it was always a mix of men and women. And I thought, how special would it be if it was all women? And how different would that be? Because the dynamic's different. Um, everybody's kind of vulnerable, but out there to be together and help one another. And I felt like that really came together in the Trino Nice Rally. It was such a tight knit community by the end. And in the beginning, I, I don't think I knew half the people. so. Really cool to see that unfold over eight days. So this year, the first rally will be in Spain in a month. Oops, super sorry for that. Uh, the first rally will be in Spain uh, in a month from today. So it's April 29th to May 6th. We have eight days to ride 680K through the mountains. I've never ridden this route, but it looks fantastic. There are loads of resources online for information. Uh, and it's going to be awesome. Second rally will be the Trino Nice rally again, and that starts September 9th. Uh, eight days to finish that as well. Um, both routes have different options. You can take shortcuts, you can make it your own. It's not about riding the exact route, but being out there and enjoying each other's company and enjoying the beauty of the routes. Um, we are also scouting a third route this summer in Slovenia. Uh, the scouting mission will happen in July, and then We'll come out of that with a similar distance route uh, to make another rally in 2023. So the idea is the rallies will be for 50 women every time. We won't grow the number of people, uh, but we want to just have more of them. So there are more opportunities to travel in more places and, and bring different new communities um, all over the place. So that's the main idea. I'm super excited for it um, and would love to help in any way that I can. Slovenia sounds amazing. Sign me yeah, up. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, so this is the uh, Montañas Vacias route that we're riding this year. It was put together by Ernesto, um, and he has so much passion for this area and this route. This is where he grew up. He was inspired by the Trino Nice rally uh, to make a route in his own homeland. Uh, significant for this route is that it is very low population. It's medieval. There are old shelters that you can stay in for free. Uh, there's loads of climbing. It's mostly dirt road. So any kind of bike from a gravel bike to a full suspension bike would be great. Um, just figuring out how you can pack your gear and, and have fun out there. Nick, are you signed up for Montana's Vachias? You're going to love the history. <laughs> <laughs> You'll take your archaeology kit with you as well. <laughs> you watched the video, Ernesto, that 30 minute YouTube video that's up, like, 
incredible. I can't wait for it. The history. Yeah, I'm very excited. Amazing. So now if we move on to Phoebe, I'm sure you've got loads of input from not only your own racing and riding experiences, but also from a medical perspective. Um, Really great to hear those from you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Phoebe. I'm uh, I'm a doctor, as it's been mentioned. Um, I've been a doctor for, we were working this out the other day, so I've been a doctor for 11 years. Uh, this My formal graduation was this week, 11 years ago, so that made me feel very old because um, it only feels like yesterday I was a drunken medical student, but I have learned quite a lot along the way. Um, and I apply, I do tend to apply quite a medical mind to my bikepacking um, in that I'm the first person to consider all possible disasters um, from broken spines, pelvises, legs, to concussion, to diarrhea, to vomiting. Um, And despite that, um, people are often quite shocked at the minimal kind of medical equipment that I take with me. So I'm an emergency medicine doctor, um, but I specialize particularly in uh, children, but I see children from birth to 18. So I have a very wide variety of patients. Um, but I am also a trained expedition medic, um, although that, that I haven't done any formal expedition medicine in the last couple of years because I've been at home with my daughter. Um, as you can currently see from this very large picture of me, I'm currently pregnant. So my adventures have been paused slightly um, at the moment, but uh, we're still bikepacking, um, albeit very, very slowly with double the snacks, if you thought that was even possible. But yeah, so from, from my perspective, um, today I was hoping to answer any questions that people have about because some of the more medical aspects so what would you take in your first aid kit um, Catherine's already mentioned periods and managing periods but we can talk uh, if anyone's got any questions about the hormonal side of managing managing periods as, as well and the kind of medical side of managing some of those symptoms um, as well as yeah uh, keeping kind of clean and safe on the bike as well because the last thing you want is again Catherine alluded to wearing your shorts when you're asleep like <laughs> I honestly can't think of anything worse <laughs> you're better off naked <laughs> please in my defense at the time I'd actually had a couple of beers beforehand and you know maybe neglected that simple act of taking off my shorts but yeah <laughs> come on Catherine, the, the old myth that we were all taught as you know the the vulva needs to breathe <laughs> Um, certainly after a day on the bike um, yeah getting some fresh air down there is definitely important um, but yeah any questions that you have please put them in the Q&A box and we can talk through um, some of those and you know saddle sores feminine hygiene whatever you know there's no no stone unturned no area is too intimate for us to talk about it's it's no problem I I having fished many things out of many orifices there's no way anyone could ever embarrass me in any way shape or form so it won't be something that I haven't heard or seen before. Brilliant can I kick off with a question Phoebe Uh, you mentioned first aid kits there if you were going on say a week-long bikepacking trip something like um, Montana's Fathias hopefully that was right that time um, what sort of things would you be looking to pack in a first aid kit? So for me, the, the stuff that I'd take for two days would be the same as I'd take probably for seven days, but maybe slightly more, a few more tablets. But um, I take a very basic amount of kit everywhere um, in terms of bikepacking. Um, and I try and use things that, can, that have dual purposes. So um, I don't take fancy medical stuff. Almost all wounds or injuries can be patched back together with duct tape. Um, so from a dressings point of view, I would take I take duct tape wrapped around my hip flask because whiskey is obviously medicinal as well. That's my personal tipple of choice, but not currently. Just to clarify. So we wrap wrap it around your hip flask and then you can unwind it so you don't have to take a, a whole roll of duct tape. And you can um, trim it to make steri strips. So any wounds, you can steri strip back together and it works better than actual conventional steri strips. Or you can literally just wrap it round and it will it will heal and cover and protect blisters, grazes, small lacerations, that kind of thing. So that's my like won't go anywhere without it. And then you can use it to fix stuff on your bike as well. So it's dual purpose. 
always take your duct tape. And then um, from a medication point of view, I would take some painkillers, I always take ibuprofen. Um, I always take um, Imodium because I've got this overwhelming fear of getting diarrhea in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I always take an anti-sickness um, medication for a similar reason, because I just I don't want to get to the point where I've got vomiting and diarrhea and I can't get on my bike because I'm being too sick and I'm too dehydrated. Um, so I take, take those. If I was abroad, probably outside of Europe, so not, not particularly the trip you were mentioning, but if it, I was further afield, um, I'd take some antibiotics that would treat travellers' diarrhea as well. But yeah, for, for, for the next um, rally, I would take painkillers, anti-diarrheal tablets, and anti-sickness. So even just a travel sickness tablet will do, will do the trick. Um, and I take some Gaviscon tablets as well, and some painkillers, as I mentioned, and my duct tape. And that would really oh, sorry. No, that's that. That would be it. You know, I, you I, you wouldn't need much more than that. Yeah, that's really out. quite minimal, isn't it? In comparing, like, I know as bike packers, we have this obsession with minimizing weight because you know the more that you carry, the more you have to haul up whatever hike a bike or mountain or whatever. And I think if you think of first aid kit, you have this image of your mind of this great big chunky green box or what have you that's going to really weigh you down. But that's really, you know, it should be really easy to fit on the bike. Yeah, so most of you would, would take a, a long sleeve base layer, right? You know, to wear in the evening or to wear on your bike. So if someone broke their collarbone, you can easily make a um, triangular bandage with the long sleeve base layer or a jacket. So you, why would you need to, why would you carry a bandage, which is no use to you in any other way when you can take something that you can put on when you're cold? Yeah. Um, it's the same, I would, people often pack tampons um because obviously even when you're even when you know that your period is not due there's a chance that because you're pushing yourself your body will think actually my body's quite stressed I'm working hard I absolutely don't want any chance of conceiving at this moment so sometimes people end up with a bit of a surprise period um when they're under that kind of stress so a couple of um non-applicated tampons uh, are useful because if you fall off and bash your nose you can use those for nosebleeds and we use those in the hospital so they'll they have more than one job or you can you know unpick the bit of cotton wool and you can put that underneath your duct tape and then you can put your duct tape on top nice I hadn't even thought about that <laughs> and I thought it would have been the opposite I thought maybe if you were doing something perhaps putting yourself out of your comfort zone or what you'd usually ride and like riding big distances every day then your body might think oh, you know, it might delay a period or something. So I hadn't even thought about something coming on a bit earlier than expected. Yeah, so a, a few of the women that have done Silk Road and Atlas, so I was meant to do Atlas Mountain Race before um, it was cancelled for two years in a row. And then I was, ended up uh, with child. So um, it's not the appropriate time for me to go this year, but maybe next year once it's grown up enough to be left <laughs> to fend for itself. Um, but yeah, they've mentioned that they've, they've come and stuck halfway through because they've, they've ended up on their period and it's a bit of a bit of a shock so it's it's worth just having at the back of your mind I mean if you're in the UK you're probably never that far away from a shop so you know it's not the end of the world but out somewhere like that it's probably just you just need something to get you through maybe that next 12 24 hours before you you, you know when your next point of civilization is I think Jenny Tuff actually mentioned something about that on Atlas Mountain Race um and went on to win so obviously it wasn't holding her back in any way um, and I'm sure there'll be people listening who've perhaps read some of, uh, is it Stacey Sims's work on hormones throughout training? And um, is that something that you've looked into much and you've found has a big impact on your bikepacking? Yeah, well, um, I use my, so I train around my menstrual cycle um, and, I, and that's really helped me in the last couple of years. So um Previously, I used the implant as a contraception, so I had no periods at all. Um, and that probably wasn't, for me, uh, particularly healthy because it, I couldn't work out when my body was struggling and when it wasn't. Um, and I, and I've, it's documented on my, my Instagram. I, I struggled to conceive and have children because probably because I'd hammered my body and my hormones to, to the point of no return. So this particular baby is a bit of a surprise. <laughs> um, but it's... 
it's important to, it's a really good marker of how healthy your body's feeling and how it's coping with stress so um i find it quite useful to have a period and i use it with my training so i know that a couple of days before i'm due on i will take it easy and i'll just concentrate on some strength work or, and i and i won't push myself too hard and then as soon as my period comes usually the second day i can really hit the training much harder and i'll i'll get much better watts and my my numbers will be much better so and i know then that's helped me if my if my period's due when i'm racing um you know something that I'm that I really want to do well in I think it's a psychological I'm like oh no I'll have a few extra like woman watts for that race so I hold it's on amazing that, isn't it because I think conventionally the vibe is that you're on your period so you know you need a bit of extra chocolate or you're not feeling great or you've got cramps or a headache or something but it's actually when you're at your strongest so yeah it might be inconvenient that you have to you know find a toilet every couple of hours or whatever um but you can really like turn that on its head in your own mind to play it out as a really good thing and i think everyone's an individual so so everybody's experience of their hormones and periods will be different and some people will find the first day they feel brilliant and others uh, you know i always feel a bit heavy and sluggish and slow um and like you know have cramps and feel a bit rubbish but those next following days you know and, and I, some of that will be psychological as well now knowing my body is going to perform better um but it's understanding those nuances about your own body are really helpful for tracking your own health um and as women like i i think for years for, for decades now you know once periods have been taboo but also they haven't been a priority for people and actually they're such a good marker of your overall health um that they're they're important we should take note of them and we should try and embrace them a bit more absolutely um one question and then we'll move on um some of our other panelists we can come back for some more questions at the end um cat would like to know would you consider taking one of those tablets that delays your period as a once off i'm considering trying it for a summer trip yeah so i think if you've got a trip that you're really looking forward to and you know that it'd be absolutely rubbish if you were on your period because it's just a faff and it's just an extra thing to worry about. There's no harm in, um, it's nothisterone that you take and it's a, a type of progesterone. Uh, you take it three days before you do on and you take it three times a day. And it should, for, for most people, work very well. There are a couple of medical contradictions um, which are similar to um, the contradictions for the combined oral contraceptive pill. So it's worth just having a quick chat with your, with your GP. But most GPs would... Do you, uh, you could um, do an e-consult or a phone con uh, phone consultation and say, this is when I'm due on. Can I have a prescription? And they'll, they'll fax it out. Uh, they'll send it out to you. No problem. Nice. I um, actually used one when I was 18 and I did my Duke of Edinburgh award, which is a it was like a four day hike in the Atlas Mountains. Um, and yeah, I didn't fancy being on my period in the middle of nowhere. Um, and yeah, I had to great effect. Um, so great, we will move on now. We can save any more questions that you might have either in the chat or the questions for Phoebe and we'll come back at the end. We'll now move on to Nick of the New Forest Off-Road Club. Hey, um, so excited to be here. That was already, I've been taking notes. I need to sort out my first aid kit. I'm Nick, I am um, based in Dorset, Hampshire and along with a group of people, we're part of a cycling community called the New Forest Off-Road Club. Um, are we doing the whole slides now, Gabby or Catherine, or are we just doing intros? Yeah, go for it. Perfect. Um, so just this picture definitely brings back loads of anxiety for me. So I've got to caveat this by saying I do work for Lush. So a lot of the products I'm gonna mention that are fantastic for staying fresh whilst you're bikepacking and are spill free also happen to be um, Lush products, but um, I'm here in a personal capacity. This picture was taken on my first overnighter bike pack in September, 2020. And I vowed never again, because I was so incredibly anxious and had the worst sleep of my life. And here I am now, you can't stop me doing an overnighter. I'm school night bivy and left and right. All of my <laughs> holidays are now, um, yeah, completely shaped around going camping on my bike so it's been an absolute 180 for me um this was a beautiful spot actually in the new forest so the new forest off-road club just to caveat is a women and non-binary led cycling community based in the new forest 
and we are dedicated to increasing representation in the outdoors by providing gorgeous matriarchal experiences. If you don't know about us, check us out. We do have a Camus account with rides in the New Forest and that's our Instagram just there too. Um, and yeah, some products that I take bikepacking. I've had a sneaky look at Vera's slide and they are fantastic <laughs> and covers a couple of products that I would have otherwise mentioned. So I'm gonna, I've got to, yeah, I'm gonna lead with what I think is a couple of absolute non-negotiables. And that is the powder shower. Now this is, this is what I took on the um, Women's Torino Nice Rally. And I feel like most people had a go. Gabby? I had had a go, (laughs) I had a go. And yeah, I did feel fresher for sure. (laughs) What did you do with it? Or what did I make you do with it? I think I remember putting some, yeah. But also I think I put some on eat. (laughs) I think we were all just queuing up with our armpits. I'm saying, Nick, freshen up. (laughs) Um, yes, absolutely that. So it's basically, and I, so I work for Lush. I would recommend the Grinch because it is literally, it smells like mint and rosemary, but essentially any powder that's antibacterial and you can make your own, go get yourself some cornstarch or whatever you want to do, and then just put some essential oils in it. But it, what's fantastic about it is that if you already don't smell great, it literally reverses you not smelling great because the powder absorbs any wet and then the antibacterial um, essential oils stop spell. So it's just 10 out of 10 and I use it everywhere. Under my arms, pants, shoes, everywhere. And I think if there is no other cosmetic, you take bike back in. It's really, really good. If you're doing multiple day trips and you don't think you're gonna have access to wash, absolutely 10 out of 10. Um, what I wanted to mention, the reason why I included this picture Yes, Tamara, I miss you. Bonjour, ça va? <laughs> um, something, I included this picture because I was 10 out of 10 anxious here. Catherine and I hadn't met and Catherine, after my very dramatic, I think I did an Insta story where I was like, never again. I'm selling all my, I just bought that tent. And then I was like, it's not for me. <laughs> I've, given, I've given it a go, but it's not for me. But I think what I've now learned is that fragrance is very grounding for me. It always has been. And from an anxiety point of view, smelling something that's familiar and that you enjoy is actually fantastic. And that is now why I never, well, yeah, I never go anywhere overnight or wise without a solid perfume. So again, um, this one is called Breath of God and it has notes of pine and like citrus in it it's absolutely incredible um but you can get any again solid perfumes um you can get some amazing ones varying from again if you just want to make your own with some cocoa butter and put some essential oils in it or if you want to go a bit more bougie you can but it melts on your fingertips and then imagine you're about to bed down in your bivy and you're a bit you're like am I is this okay does everything feel all right here you can just put this anywhere you want and then it can help ground you. And vanilla as an essential oil, a lot of people find helps calm. Um, But yeah, I think I really wanted to mention that for this picture because I've come a long way and solid perfumes help me get there. (laughs) I feel like this is a stark contrast to the very useful information of carrying ibuprofen, but here we are. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Next slide, Gabby. I think we're doing all right for time okay hair I feel strongly about this again um I know Vera is going to talk about protective um hairstyles but putting your hair in a plait whilst you've got a helmet on I know everyone's familiar with but um I find before you go on a multi-day trip and the longest multi-day trip I've done where I've just camped outside was the King Alfred's Way and it was four nights um and I find thinking about what you're going to wash your hair with before you go is very helpful um, and I use a leave-in conditioning milk before I put my helmet on for four plus days and I use a product called super milk and this is incredible it smells heavenly so back to the scent part of essential oils if you do believe in the benefits of aromatherapy not everyone does but if you do super milk um, has this really amazing tonka scent so it smells, it's one of the, a lot of people who ride with the New Forest of Road Club compliment me on how I smell. And I promise you the majority of that is what I just put in my hair. Um, and 
I don't have much of it. It's pretty lank, as you can see in that table, in that picture there. But I wash my hair, use super milk, put it in a plait, and then that's me. I'm not touching it for what the, the rest of the bike packing trip, whatever that is. If I've got someone I know that can do me a French plait, I'm even happier. But the super milk really helps to protect and condition in the long run. Thanks, Grace. Don't know if that's my best friend, Grace, or another one who's just loving it. Um, and I think I'll mention one more. I've got some other things here, but I'm so keen to get to other people's slides is the shampoo bar. So again, definitely not the only place you can get it. This one is a Honey I Washed My Hair shampoo bar from Lush. I enjoy this one. So on the Three Nannies Rally, um, we did do bivying. We camped out a couple of times, both Tamara and I, but we also made the most of an incredible Italian Alpine Lodge. Um, Tamara, if you can put the Google address of that amazing Alpine Lodge we stayed in. So it just meant that like in the middle of this really, really lovely and but intense bike ride, we did get a bit of R&R &R in the shape of this Alpine Lodge. And a shampoo bar is washing your hair and it's washing your bib shorts and it's washing your body and it's washing everything. So you can do like laundry with it as well. They're really, really robust. And the Honey I Washed My Hair shampoo bar is one of the more moisturizing ones. So whilst it definitely, I wouldn't say is a substitute for hair conditioner, um, if you do have dry hair, I'm, I don't take super milk with me. I'm using that before I put my helmet on. And the shampoo bar, 10 out of 10, should last 90 washes if you store it correctly. I am. Um, I was very lucky to try the blue one. I can't remember what it's called. After grinder, and it came in a little cork um, box thing, and it was such beautiful weather after grinder that before leaving, we went down to the river, a few of us, because um, we didn't want to leave McCunclet. And this cork box just floated on the river surface as well, and had the most divine post very dusty race wash <laughs> in the river before heading home. It was, yeah, gorgeous. Oh, nice to hear it. Yeah, those cork pots are fantastic. They are, they're made from um, cork, which we get from Portugal. Um, obviously very lightweight and good to, I put, I put mine in a wax wrap if you're like really, really thinking about how much space you've got, but the cork pots are really good again from like an antimicrobial point of view. Um, and you had a scenic there, Catherine, by the sounds of things. With short hair, it's got sea salt in it, so it's good for a bit of volume, that one. Nice. Shorter hair if you had it back there. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. I am. Um, can I just actually know? Because I think Vera is going to talk about teeth. I'm just really intrigued. A question I have is how often people brush their teeth when they're out on the bike? Because I feel like there might be a variety in answers. Because but... I'm just like in the morning, not before night time. Do not... any of our other panelists have any contributions? How often you're brushing your teeth? Yeah, I probably um, brush mine like five times a day or so. No, I think oh. that's like my hygiene is. Yeah. is uh... <laughs> Mouth. And even, you know, even when I'm racing, maybe not five, but definitely two or three, because you're eating so much, you know, you're eating all this different weird food. I mean, that's like, and that's where you'll have problems too, is your mouth. Mm. Wait, sorry. You brush your teeth five times a day, Leo. Yeah, the you know, basically, I mean, yeah, four or five. I, yeah, like, I mean, you just I'm have gonna... a toothbrush handy. You could even brush while you ride. <laughs> there is no way you store it. <laughs> What's the whole secret oh, weapon? This is toothpaste. Yeah. She's just fueled by toothpaste. Just saying. <laughs> you know, you feel you feel kind of low, and then you brush your teeth, and all of a sudden you feel fresh. I mean, there's the trick right there. But I just, I that's so. I was like, I'm gonna sound like an absolute grot bag by just doing it once a day. But like, Leo will be like once a week. <laughs> and I'm like, oh I'm God, no, that's so bad. I mean, I won't shower for a week, but I'll brush my teeth several times a day. You can't multitask showering, but you can toothbrushing. I play to you. Well, on that um, toothbrushing note, I think we will segue nicely into some more. Um, oh, sorry. What did I put here? I got to remember. Oh, that was it. Because I knew um, if you scan that, you'll go to the New Forest of Road Club website and myself and Meredith. So we're two ride leaders for the New Forest of Road Club. Um, and we've got a Google Sheet with our kit list and there's a cosmetics section with links and stuff in it. So there's not just mine, but there's also Meredith's. So I just know, like, obviously, if you want to see the full extent of the cosmetics I travel with and Meredith, who is a pal who works, um, 
gives does rides for the new Russell Road Club, you can find it there. Fantastic. Um, one much. quick question, just whilst we're talking about it. Um, Nick, do you have any recommendations for um, sun cream that's best to travel with? Mm. That is definitely an essential. And I would say like nothing less than SPF 30. I use Glossier's one. It's fantastic. It's really lightweight. It's more like a gel. That's what I recommend. But um, yeah, I think it's you, you definitely take it. Can you imagine if you had to end a bike ride because you were just so sunburned or got a heat stroke? Mm. Um, I, but yeah, I'm using the Glossier one at the moment. I can't remember the name of it, but I'll get the link and put it in there. I, I use the um, the La Roche, I can't pronounce it, pronounce, but La Roche Posse. It's like a little bottle and it's an SPF 50 as well. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. And it doesn't leave a white cast on you, which is great because I also like skin colour. So definitely recommend that. Nice. Fantastic. I would so just we'll move on to Vera, um, who has lots of practical tips and some amazing slides. <laughs> Over to you, Vera. Um, thank you. Um, so, yeah, um, my name is Vera. Um, I'm based in Cardiff and I describe myself as an adventure cyclist. I will say I'm relatively new to bikepacking, having done my first ever bikepacking trip almost exactly a year ago. So around Easter time of 2021. So I'll caveat that my experiences and lessons um, are from a beginner's perspective. Um, so yeah, <laughs> just take it or leave it. Um, in terms of cycling though, I got into cycling about five years ago through riding a tandem with my partner, who's now my husband. So that's the photo on the left. And that got me hooked on the adventure side of things. And then over time I thought, oh, I better get, get some independence <laughs> and start pulling my own weight. Um, so I got into road riding. Um, um, so for, for a few years, I was a bit on and off. Um, and it wasn't really until early last year, uh, 2021, that my cycling life really expanded. Um, and that was when I won the Ultra Distance Scholarship, which is the uh, photo on the left. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of this before, it was this amazing um, opportunity set up by a now very good friend of mine, Taylor Doyle. And it was um, basically to introduce a newbie to uh, the world of ultra or endurance cycling. And it was targeted at people from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds who are very underrepresented in those in those areas. So I won this scholarship, which came with free entry to this crazy race called the Pan Celtic Race, um, which is a 2,000 kilometer road race. And I was also set up with a cycling performance coach, Alison Wood. And I also won a custom built bike, which was the thing that drew me to apply because everyone likes free bike. Um, and I used that to ride the event. Um, the scholarship took me on this crazy journey um, from a leisure cyclist to competing in my first ultra in the space of about six months. So before this, I was riding about 50 kilometers a week on average. Um, and in the space of six months, I was doing back to back days of over 200 kilometers um, a day. So quite a big shift. Um, and the months leading up to this big challenge were an education in self-sufficiency. Um, and I had quite a steep learning curve. So I had never so much as heard of a bivy. I had never wild camped and I had only ever stayed in a tent about once before in my life. So this is about a year ago that this is what we're talking about. So I had to learn quite a lot and I had to learn how to look after my body on limited resources. Um, and I also appreciated that poor hygiene can be the thing that can put an end to a trip and you really don't want that. Um, and um, minimizing weight um that you're carrying an ultra distance race or any bike packing is quite important in ultra distance it becomes a bit of an obsession i think so the photo on the bottom right just shows i was just pretend to cutting my toothbrush down to reduce weight don't do that just carry a full length toothbrush you'll brush your teeth better um, but everyone took me seriously and thought i'd like cut my toothbrush to, to that size <laughs> um but yeah so um if you move on to the next slide please Catherine. In, in terms of staying fresh while bikepacking, um, as I said earlier, I still consider myself a relative beginner to it, but there are a few things I've found which have worked for me during my sort of um, dive into the deep end of bikepacking and ultra. And they've also found that they've worked quite well in the more fun, um, leisurely bikepacking trips I've done since, since my race as well. Um, so I'll just do a quick head to toe. The little um, engineer lady in the middle is a, is my avatar, I call her, because I'm an engineer and I found this lovely little doll and I was like, this looks like me, I'll take it everywhere, <laughs> so I take it to site and everything. Um, 
But anyway, um, um, from head, um, the photos on the left, this is me like enjoying my fro. And when you put a helmet on it, it just, it's all a mess and you get proper helmet hair. Um, so someone with sort of Afro textured 4C hair, I got to pre-plan um, and think carefully about what my, what state my hair needs to be in um, during a bikepacking to avoid ending up in a situation where the only choice I've got when I get back home is a complete bus cut. If that's what you like, that's fine. But I kind of, to avoid getting that sort of matted hair, I've got to put my hair in a protective style. For me, that often means, um, Nick already mentioned this as well, plaiting your hair. And sometimes I put um, braid extensions and it just means it's out of the way as well. Um, and it'll be different for different type of people and different hair, but just try and find something that is minimal maintenance for you and get your hair hydrated and one moisturized before you do that as well. Um, face, again, I like to keep it simple. I normally bottle up my general all body moisturizer. So if I'm at home, I'll have a different moisturizer for my face and different for my body. But if I'm going on a trip, I'll just stick to one. Um, Cause um, for me, it's not about having my face beat every day. It's just about not looking crusty, keeping my skin healthy and avoiding outbreaks and eczema flares and things like that. So I just try and keep it simple that way. Um, lips, my favorite, favorite thing ever is this Palmer's Cocoa, um, put an image there. It's like a SPF 15 lip balm. And again, that just is a complete lip saver because sometimes you, you forget your lips can also get burned. And that really helps. I also carry a small pot of Vaseline. So I sort of, I, my, my thing is I've got all these sample pots that I decant all my big stuff into when I'm on a trip to keep the weight down, but it's also just super efficient. And Vaseline is one of the most versatile things um, out there. I mean, growing up, my mom used Vaseline on it, everything. Like it was about our all body moisturizer. It was, you know, the lip balm. It was the thing she put on our wounds whenever we grazed ourselves, because it helps keep it moist and prevents forming like um, hard scabs and stuff. So a little pot of Vaseline, I never leave home without that. Um, in terms of dental hygiene, so we've already touched on this, but I carry with me often this tiny tube of toothpaste on trips. This will last me weeks normally. So it's just a yeah, small size sort of travel toothpaste. But I was also recently introduced to some toothpaste tabs um, by Nick, who, who had sent me some their little, little, little tablets and they're quite efficient. You can pack just the amount you need as well and just sort of use those as your toothpaste. And they're a great way of saving space. Um, for me, I brush about twice a day. Um, I wish I'm, I'm going to try brushing more because one of the things I have had issues with when I was doing the race is these mouth ulcers because I was eating all these sweets and all these things and my mouth just attacked me and then I couldn't eat anything else. So I resorted to having a tub of ice cream in my handlebar bag, as you can see on the photo on the right. And that was very soothing. So at least <laughs> something good came out of it. But yeah, I, I definitely brush more frequently as well. Um, and nether regions, the lady bits. Um, I tend to pack some biodegradable or non-plastic wet wipes for those trips where I know, you know, I might not get a shower in a few days. And um, I don't often take a whole pack. I'll just actually take the amount I need into the Ziploc bag to keep the moisture and I'll carry that. And um, at the end of the day, wipe down, it gets rid of the shiny cream if you've, if you've used some the sweat and all of that and just gets the area clean um, and depending on whether I've had any sort of chafing issues I also carry a little pot of um, like a pseudo cream which I can apply at night but if that's not an issue I just let it breathe um, like Phoebe said just like air it out and just let it let your um, your bits recover so that's what I often do but um, pseudo cream chamois cream and little pots really handy to have as well. Um, I also carry an extra pair of padded shorts. On any trip, I'd normally have the one I'm wearing and an extra pair. And I aim to wash them each day or at the end of the day or the next morning or wherever I can find water, um, you know, the one that I used the day before, I'll give that a wash. And sometimes I'll dangle it. So I'll just air my clean, dirty, clean laundry to the world on my handlebars so that it dry as I'm cycling. But I find having an extra pair of bits um, really just helps keep um, that part of the body sort of nice and healthy. Um, yeah, and the last one really is feet. Um, I just try and keep them dry. I haven't had any sort of um, trench, trench foot or anything like that, any issues with that, but that's because I avoid puddles and splashing it through stuff a lot of the time. But yeah, at the end of the day, just get your feet dry, 
I know I've heard things like talcum powder can help um, with things like that. Um, but just making sure you go to bed with dry feet and pack a spare um, sort of woolly socks and that sort of thing. Merino socks are a godsend for me. Um, really helps. So that's sort of a, um, sort of a snapshot of my hygiene checklist on, on races and bikepacking trips. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Vera. I especially liked a few of the things that you said there um, resonated with me personally. I'm sure a lot of other people um, will. SPF lip balm, because it's like not only the sun, but I think like the wind if you're out all day. I, it's the first thing to always go is I get these like chapped, nasty lips. Um, yeah, that was a really, really good one. Um, and again, coming back to toothbrushing is something I'm not an ultra racer myself, but I've heard about people brushing their teeth to wake themselves up at night. So when I go to bed, I'm one of these weird people that always gets a little bit hyper after brushing my teeth. Um, <laughs> apparently it's a thing. Um, but certain like ultra riders, racers do it to help them stay up during the night. So I wonder if there's something in that. Um, but yeah, tooth tabs, definitely a good idea for uh, multi-day trips where you don't want to take a huge bulky great big toothpaste and Nick commenting about her electric toothbrush we had this hilarious camp in an olive grove on the Torino Nice rally Gabby Nick Tamara Sean and I I think that was everyone and um yeah this whirring sound from Nick's Vivi as she gets out her full electric toothbrush <laughs> and there's me with my tiny little cut down one trying to get all my marginal gains <laughs> But just as that's the thing like I'll carry the electric toothbrush because I don't feel like I've brushed my teeth if I don't use it but I'm only doing it once a day so it's like there's no logic to <laughs> oh. <laughs> but the one time I brush them I, they, it needs to be with an electric toothbrush fantastic well thank you very much everyone um we'll now head over to our Q&A um so we've got loads of questions um in there already and feel free to drop in any more I know we've got a few in the chat as well so um here's an open question to everyone how many days would you wear bibs on long trips would you rinse every day or truly wash every couple of days phoebe would you like to kick us off i think you're on mute yeah sure let me have a quick look how many years i've been using zoom now and i still um about some of the questions that you can see so i noticed that someone is asking about um follicular cysts and hard lumps and and things um in terms of chamois cream and um kind of from, uh, hygiene kind of down below and chafing and uh i just i'm not a massive advocate for kind of commercial um chamois cream everyone has probably one that they particularly enjoy um but the from my point perspective as a as a medic and the tried and tested um various different products is that there's a there's a just a normal um emollient ointment called double base cream or double base gel which is better actually um i can pop it in the chat but uh, it's what we would recommend as from a medical point of view to keep um, everything kind of lubricated and clean. There's no fragrance. You're not going to get any kind of reaction. Lots of people use it for treatment of eczema. We use it um, in children and babies as well. And because I, you know, my old adage of something has to have more than one function to come on a trip, you can use it as moisturizer. You can use it instead of soap um, and you can use it to keep, you know, to stop any chafing and you can put it anywhere. So someone thinks someone just mentioned that they were having some, uh, breast chafing as well or sometimes even under your underarms or various other parts of the body a bit of this stuff will work wonders. Uh, thanks Phoebe I've got the the zero double gel I get that on prescription because I'm in Wales I get it for free it's my body moisturizer I did not know you could use it for so many other things so I'm definitely going to be trying that out and swapping it out <laughs> for, for um, yeah for, for some all the all the gynecologists that have been that have taken an interest of which there are not many but they've taken an interest in um treating women's saddle sores and preventing them that's what they'd recommend wow. um and it, yeah then there's no chance and then because you don't know sometimes you know you might use something once a weekend when you're doing a long ride but you know, you're only using it every day and you're more sweaty and your skin's more sensitive you may you may be more likely to have a reaction you're not going to get a reaction to this so 
um, it's, it's really useful for that. So that would be another of my top tips. Um, and in terms of if you're getting infections of follicular cysts and spots and things, um, an antibacterial wash, um, so something, a proper kind of medically prescribed antibacterial wash will help with any folliculitis. You can use that before you go on the trip. So just, just um, use it for a few days and what it will do is decolonize you with that particular bacteria that's, that's causing the problem. Um, so that should, it might not stop it completely because obviously you're sweating and stuff, but it might, it should just minimalize that, that, that risk of, a, of kind of those infective little pustules and, and, and boils and people can get around the, the saddle area and the creases and things and don't shave everyone should be very hairy that would be my other please that was going to be no my hair next question <laughs> no please hair is good we have it for a reason particularly pubic hair so it's very good for bike packing is that because it's um sort of reduces friction in that area or would you recommend against um shaving because of the impact of the skin yeah, so shaving just introduces bacteria into the into the hair follicles, and then you, you you're chopping them down, and you're irritating the skin, and you're upsetting your you know your skin barrier, um, and then if you add onto that the chafing and the regrowth, you're just you are onto a recipe of disaster, and 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 you're going to be really uncomfortable. So um, yeah, just au naturel is the is the way forward for for bike packing and and you know good vulval and vaginal health. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question here from Joanna. I'd love to know how people deal with not sleeping well on trips. Sometimes even when I'm completely exhausted, I do not sleep well in a tent or a bivy. Would love any ideas. Well, I think Nick's already um, given us an idea with this sort of scent grounding. Anybody else got anything that springs to mind? I used to struggle a little bit if it was like a particularly exhausting day sometimes you're like so buzzing from everything that's happened that it's quite um difficult to get off um i also used to carry a hip flask and enjoy a little tipple of whiskey which i found helped me sleep especially if i was a bit nervous um but now i'm teetotal so i can't use that anymore which is a bit gutting <laughs> i i think it's really common actually catherine and, and i notice I, I know i sleep but i do shift work so i sleep at all different times of the day and night anyway and um and often do really long, very stressful, intense shifts and have that same feeling of lying in bed and my brain and my body is sort of like fizzing with activity. Um, and so I think, and I think sometimes on bikepacking trips and ultra racing, it's like, I've got to sleep now. I've got, you know, this amount of time I need to sleep so that I'm ready for the next day. And then that feeds into this sort of vicious cycle of, why am I not asleep? I'm going to be really tired. So it's important, I think, just to, just take a few minutes of kind of mindfulness and and actually just sometimes just all going through your body I'm going to relax my head I'm going to relax my shoulders I'm going to relax my back and and focusing on on that and and actually just using some of those kind of mindful techniques just to calm everything down your, your body's been on high alert all day even if you've just been pedaling along you know your body's still in a threat mode you know looking for hazards and making sure you're eating and looking after yourself um, but yeah, someone's just popped up in the in the chat about magnesium and, and melatonin, both of which I use frequently um, at home to cope with shift work. And if they work for you, then there's no reason why you couldn't use them um, when bikepacking. I guess that all comes into the sort of practice and training side of things. So maybe don't leave it until your big trip, but that's something that you could work into, like just techniques to get to sleep at home or on little training rides and things. Yeah, I think um, if I can just build on that as well, just the what really helped me out from getting moving through this like anxiety, I'm lying awake, terrified. I know that's different to like not being able to sleep, but now literally like lights out, I'm out for the count. Just recognizing that the rituals that you have at home, just try and replicate that. I'm not getting involved in racing. So this is very different to when you're like on the clock, but just things like putting an eye mask on, somebody already said earplugs, if you have a hot drink before you go to bed, even if it's a hassle to get the stove out, doing it, taking makeup or like washing the face are things that I would do at home. And that, I guess, mentally makes me know that I'm about to get to sleep. Um, so I can't stress that enough. Obviously not in a race environment, but if you're just trying to look to have a nice bivy, I recommend. 
Nice. I'm definitely hooked on sleepy tea at the moment. <laughs> and I think it is as much the routine and the ritual of it as it is actually what's in the tea. So yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, another medically focused question, probably for you, Phoebe, would you take saline or just use water if you, if from your bottle for clearing things? I assume that means like grazers and cuts. Yeah, no, I just use water. Um, you can, and bottles are great for um, rinsing stuff out. So uh, they're great for washing your eyes out because you've got like a bit of pressure. They're great for washing cuts out. Um, yeah, but it's just whatever you're, you're drinking water would be, will be absolutely fine. I certainly would not be carrying um, any saline or um, eye washes or anything like that. It's just extra, extra weight, extra hassle and the chances of you needing to use it are minimal. You can give it a good scrub. It'll be fine. Put a bit of um, Vaseline on it, like Vera said, just to, as a barrier and then stick some, stick something over it or even just leave it to the air. You know, if it's grazes on your legs and knees and uh, elbows, just leave them to the air to dry. It'll be fine. Nice. Your body's got a good immune system, hopefully. <laughs> um, another question, what's on Lael's packing list? Perhaps not your entire packing list, because I'm sure that'd be quite long. <laughs> Actually, uh, for the rallies, I pack more than I take on most trips because I'm riding with Rue and uh, I just want to enjoy all of it. So definitely bringing a full tent, uh, comfortable sleeping pads. We have a two person sleeping bag, which is great because you have twice the heat. Um, and what else? You know, it's um, I mean, I wear the same clothing for the whole trip. I always bring a down jacket because that's just warm insulating layer. Great for sleeping in as well. Uh, I actually cut the chamois out of all of my shorts, which helps a lot with hygiene um, because you can just rinse the shorts out and they're fine. It takes it may take a little time to get used to that, but if you have problems, it's worth a try. I have other friends that that's worked for too. Rue tried it out. She doesn't like it. So she's back to a chamois, but you know, there are different ways to go about that. Um, what else, you know, basic things to fix my bike. And really it's not much. It's like chain lube, zip ties, pair of brake pads, all the stuff you can fit in like a tiny little bag. Um, sunscreen, sunscreen chapstick and yeah, that's probably about it. Um, the lighter you can keep it, the easier the climbs will be, the easier it'll be to pack in the morning. Um, and, you know, maybe just a little talk about, tiny talk about packing. I put all the sleep stuff up front, all the heavy stuff, uh, the lower you can get it uh, to the ground and to the frame, the better. Uh, clothing in the back, um, but yeah, yeah, that's, something we'll be talking about tomorrow a bit as well. Uh, I was actually sick for almost the entire Trino Nice rally. I got sick day two and that was tough. I'd been going for, I think I started racing and riding hard in May and it was September and I just overdone it. So, you know, give yourself a little grace out there. If you're not feeling great, maybe sleep for a few more hours. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing because the distances aren't that great. You don't have to be in this massive pack. You can you can catch up, you can take your own time, um, make, make the ride your own. And, and uh, you know, don't, if you're feeling anxious, what I do during racing, if I'm, my heart rate's super high after riding hard all day, I, I do that where I just imagine sinking into the ground, every part of my body just kind of swelling into the ground and then breathing deeply and, and telling myself that maybe I'm not asleep, but I am resting. And that will mm -hmm. definitely help no matter what. Um, what else? Have fun with it. You know, it's like you bring the stuff you think you need, give stuff away along the way, um, you know, take advantage of stopping in cafes, enjoying local food, sleeping in, in refuges, camping out for the night. Uh, this is an arid environment, so hopefully we'll get really good weather, but um, it's an adventure just to see how that all unfolds. Nice, thanks. Um, maybe Gabby, do you have anything in your sort of cosmetics, toiletries, that's a staple for your bikepacking trips? Oh, um, good question. I don't think I have anything actually that hasn't been mentioned. I also keep it pretty light. And then if I feel like I need something extra, I'll try and pick something up along the way from a pharmacy. Um, I had a really bad time actually when we cycled to Milan with mosquitoes. I must have had 50 mosquito bites and um, so yeah, maybe that is something in the future I'll definitely bring with me if I think there'd be mosquitoes as a repellent because I think they 
they really like me. <laughs> Very tasty. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe actually something like that. Cool. Um, this is a question for all of you. You might have experienced this. What's a good way to deal with saddle sores when you want to keep going rather than resting up? I, Lael doesn't wear bibs, right? Yeah, I actually do wear bibs. I just cut the chamois out. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Somebody <laughs> recently was like, that's like a swimsuit. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm going to hand the same thing. I don't, I don't wear bibs or chamois and just wear some fantastic Everlane black shorts that I can't recommend enough. I don't know if you've, and I know Catherine, because you were, you were weaning yourself off, right? I've been experimenting with the chamois free life. I don't think I'm quite there yet, but like a pair of bamboo uh, pants or something like that. Um, and some like more standard shorts. It's just quite nice to be a bit more casual sometimes. Um, um. I'd yeah. say I found um, learning to ride out of the saddle a lot before a big ride and getting comfortable with doing that can provide some really good relief. So when I did the race, I did loads of training rides where I'm going to go for an hour and for like for every like 10 minutes of that, I try and just stay out of the saddle. And then I found that really helpful in the race because it would just let air just draft through me <laughs> and <laughs> provide that bit of soothing um, from the saddle source. Um, um, I'd also say for me, I use um, chamois cream and I've got a little, again, that little tub in my top tube bag and I would reapply that every few hours and that sort of minty feeling that was quite, I found that quite soothing and it would get me going for a few more hours and sort of provide that relief. So that's how I've sort of dealt with it. And then just making sure at the end of the day that you're cleaning yourself and just letting your, your body airing that out and letting it recover. Um, can help with getting on, back on the bike the next day. So yeah, I've, I've not had any terrible experiences, like really bad saddle for it, but I have had a little bit and that's how I've managed that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. So I'm firmly in the, the chamois camp, I'm afraid, but uh, I wear, um, for long distances, I wear seven mesh shorts, which I've got no, they're especially designed, so there's no seams around, because one of the things that used to rub me was the seam around the back of the chamois, which not necessarily a saddle sore, but kind of on the on the cheek of your ass. And um, that, that used to drive me mad. So the seven mesh ones have got no seam. So I, I particularly like those and they're cool to pee. Um, so even now when I have to wee every 10 minutes, they're amazing. Um, and I, I have suffered with saddle sores on longer rides. Um, and I've tended to sometimes just adjusting your saddle. So sometimes just, just a, a micro adjustment. So tip it slightly forward, just takes the pressure off whichever area is particularly uncomfortable or nudge it slightly back sometimes just so that somewhere else is pressing on it. Um, and I also always tell myself um, because something is going to hurt at any given moment um, on, on these kind of things you know there'll be hours where you're super comfy and you're riding along and you're chatting to somebody else and you're having a great time but at some point your hands will hurt or your neck will hurt or your back will hurt or your legs will hurt or your bum will hurt or your lips will hurt because they're chapped and I think well what's gonna hurt like this won't hurt forever something else will hurt next so I, I entertain myself with wondering what what bit of my body will give up in the next 12 hours <laughs> That's amazing. I do the same, Phoebe. <laughs> you know what I mean, I'm like, oh, it's like rolling the dice. I Why wake up and like, hurting? yeah, like, for no reason. Well, my my bum will hurt soon. So, yeah. and I also have used my um camelback like vest thing as a sort of mini shower in times of great stress. Um, and I've sort of tucked the bladder under my arm and like hosed everything down, and um and that's <laughs> provided some one much needed relief. But you can sit in a river, you know, that would be fine. Fantastic. Um, so keeping the theme of chamois and um, hygiene down there, if you're not washing your bibs or chamois regularly, can panty liners help to keep you sanitary? Is that something that anybody's ever tried? I would say no, because they don't breathe very well, because you've got the because you've got the waterproof layer I think they would just keep the sweat and and like I, I wouldn't it wouldn't be my choice to do that I think um 
I, I mean, again, I'm, I would take two pairs of shorts and rotate them. Um, even if you just air them out, you know, even if you don't fully rinse them and you just turn them inside out and put them on your bike, you know, so that the, the chamois has time to dry at least. I mean, that's better than, than sort of sitting there with kind of a sweaty, wet, soggy, damp chamois. But I, yeah, I, I think putting anything else in there, you're just going to increase friction and, and increase the sort of insulation as well. Definitely. I had a friend of mine who was preparing to ride um, the Pan Celtic race last year. A male friend told me how he was packing several uh, heavy thickness uh, sanitary pads for when he got saddle sore. And I was like, I'm not sure that's how it works. <laughs> I don't think that's going to help you. <laughs> but um, um, yeah. Does anyone take a flannel or a washcloth? Vera, do you take? Oh, does anyone take a flannel or a washcloth? I haven't. I've, um, yeah, I've often relied on if I'm not getting a shower on the, um, the wipes. Um, and then if I get accommodation, I just sort of hand, hand wash or <laughs> that sort of thing. I tend to splash. <laughs> splash and drip dry. <laughs> uh, how about yeah. you, Nick? Well, this, I would, because this, again, I don't, I am not think, I'm not sawing my toothbrush down. That's all I'm saying. Sorry. <laughs> <Me neither. laughs> you don't have to with an electric toothbrush. You just take the bit iron. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I take two, I take two flannels, one for the face, one for the vajay. And that way I feel like it's fresh everywhere. And yeah, I can see people saying that they also love taking a flannel and I think depending obviously how many overnight is it can get increasingly gross the one that you're using for down there but I just like there's just something about like washing it and I don't even wear chamois or like bibs or anything but just like yeah all of them wheeze that I'm doing I'm not wiping I am just shaking and then you know you can only do so much with shaking so I would just say like the two flannels I would also recommend little sandwich bag so that because they're damp and you don't want them to get gross and you can just like pack it up really tight and I just think there's there's for me the difference between feeling like having a miserable day on the bike and having a really happy day on the bike is me feeling like is fit, feeling fresh and doing whatever I can do and if I've done a flannel, flannel wash and I smell relatively good and I've used some powder deodorant then good day on the bike. Uh, I would add um on the, I know someone also mentioned, asked a question about drip drying and that sort of thing. I don't because I've done that and I found that it made things not very happy there over the course of the day. So I literally, you know, like the pocket tissues you get. Um, I'm a bit economical, so I open one and I tear it in half and I'll do a bit of a dab. And I'll have a, a sort of waste bag on my bike somewhere where I can put those tissues and I'll find somewhere to dispose of them when I can. But I do find a dab just avoids that urine getting on my chamois and then smells developing and just odors and that sort of thing. Cause um, yeah, and it's, I just find it hard to drip, drip dry enough, even if I'm jumping up and down and shaking around to, <laughs> to get that back dry. Amazing. While we're on the subject of relieving ourselves, I think <laughs> somebody had mentioned um, uh, how yeah how do you relieve yourself during a bikepacking trip do you all carry a little shovel I'd be really interested to hear what people's different approaches are for this Lael would you like to kick us off sure um yeah I don't <laughs> carry a shovel uh I mean I guess you could use like a little tent stake that would work well I never really did that I never thought of it I'm usually just like kicking or like using the rock but you really should dig a hole that's what like six inches so maybe like the size of your hand deep and then bury it um or you're staying at a refuge and you don't have to do that uh especially the routes that are more traveled you know it's like think about how many people are actually living out there respect the land do your best um i don't dig a hole when i pee you know i just pee on the side of the road and then you know hopefully you're not like scaring the locals <laughs> Um, yeah, I, say, I, I just try and find a strong stick or something. Um, yeah, I try and, you know, 
way where I can, but there have been times, you know, after multiple days of riding, your body's about to explode and you're on a bike and you just throw in a hedge and find something, a rock or something to dig with and, <laughs> and get some relief. <laughs> and yeah, it's, 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 it's not something I usually like to talk about and share, but that's, that's what I've done. But I, I think I have been considering having a little shovel. I've seen those nice little camping, like compact ones to make things easier um, as well. I've got one of the little ultralight ones. It's blue anodized and it's fabulous. It weighs 12 grams. <laughs> and I have it on a little um, bit of um, paracord and it just like clips on, you know, somewhere that's easy to access. You can even dangle it if you really want to off your saddle pack. Um, much better than dangling a mug, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, not um, next to the mug? <laughs> because it never actually comes in contact with anything, or at least it shouldn't. You can share it around, you know, if I go for a, uh, a trip with, you know, five other friends, you know, you don't all need to have your own shovel. Um, so, yeah, that can make things a bit easier. Um, a great question came in from Kirsten about tips for wet weather trips. It's personally my worst nightmare is like when everything gets wet and cold and damp. Um, but does anybody have any top tips for those kind of conditions? Uh, so, so I've done a few really hideous trips in Scotland uh, where everything I everything is wet and I have a so I always take two sets of kit so I, even though with my pack the rest of my packing is relatively light um, I don't scrimp on clothing so because I, I don't like being cold so I always take two two sets of kit and I have a dry a dry set and a wet a wet set so and also because um, it's really easy to get hypothermia, even even in the UK, you know, especially in the UK, um, especially if you're up high. And it, and if you look at blogs and things that people have written about um, longer distance trips, quite a few people have come unstuck because they've just got so cold and wet that they can't they can't get warm again. So I always make sure I've got a dry pair of short socks, um, base layer, and I always take. Um, a down jacket like Lyle says I take a big down jacket and everyone always laughs but it packs down quite small and I use it as a pillow or I use it to keep warm and I also use it in my my emergency medicine mind that if we got stuck somewhere and I had to tend to someone you know I could keep them warm with it because again if you're if you're seriously injured and you get cold then you're on a road to nowhere unfortunately mm -hmm. so um and a good waterproof and I don't go without those I'm happy for my legs to get wet but I always try and keep my core and my body body dry and I would put the wet kit on in the morning you know I'd, I'd put damp stuff you know wet stuff back on wet shoes wet socks if needs be um as long as I was then going to keep moving um but I'd try and keep at least something close you know some of my base layer or something dry mm. to start with Gabby has it phenomenal way of tackling the wet weather on the Trino Nice <laughs> rally. Just ask um in a bar for a bin bag. <laughs> it was particularly stylish. Meanwhile, while Gabby and friends were up the cold as well, I think. Um Nick and I were in a bar in Briançon stuffing up well Nick was stuffing her face with a uh, rotisserie chicken you know, keeping dry and shedding ourselves of all of our wet layers. <laughs> and someone else who went, someone went for a sauna. Oh yeah, that was us as well. <laughs> we decided we'd check into a hotel because it was so stormy mm. and we all uh, had a little swim and went in the sauna. Um, and then of course in the sun, in the afternoon, beautiful sunshine. And um, it was hard to resist getting back on the road, even though we paid for a hotel room, mm. but such is the way of things. But newspaper is also really good if it's cold and you can find some and you can just shove it down your jersey um, and just anything, I think, just to give you that extra like layer of protection. Yes, yeah, space blanket. Oh, Lorenza has actually made a, a good recommendation. See if there's any gym nearby <laughs> with a sauna. Um, which might be more common in the Nordics and you can not only enjoy the sauna, but dry your clothes in there and get warm. Sounds like a um, yeah Nordic bikepacking trip coming on. <laughs> I think the other thing I would add is that um, I pack everything into dryer bags and then into my bikepacking bags. So 
lots of people will just pack straight into their like packing bags and I've t- tried and tested a number of different brands and regardless of how waterproof they tell you they are they're not own, uh, the only ones I've found to be truly waterproof are the all leave ones and even then when you're opening your bag it's absolutely pouring with rain in Scotland your bag just fills with water so everything is then packed into dry bags which helps me compress them down and then I label them so they'll say dry kit wet kit you know socks first aid kit sleeping stuff um and that yeah it's just important to try and keep because especially if you're bivvying then you haven't got a tent you haven't got stuff to to keep things dry underneath that's cool I think another thing to mention that might seem really really obvious um that I certainly go by it's probably completely different if you're racing is you don't have to camp outside every single night there's no one's like there's no grand expectation or no one's going to say you're not a true bike packer because you stayed in a refuge or a youth hostel or whatever I actually when I'm like touring or bike packing go on the role of um a night under a roof every two or three nights because it just gives you that chance to like wash all of your kit and hopefully put it in a drying room or somewhere and have a proper shower and probably have somebody else cook you a meal for a change um and you know you shouldn't like snub that and or not allow yourself to experience like one of the best things on the Torino Nice rally was one of these mountain refuges like chalet refuges where they bring you out all the local food and um yeah you get warm in front of the fire and everything and sort of recount your tales of the day before but um yeah don't deny yourself some luxuries <laughs> Um, somebody is asking here would you bring water purification material anybody got any top tips on water purifiers Uh, so when I did uh, Scott well I think Scott Giro um we always take because the middle hundred miles there's nowhere to get um food or water um so yeah we took water purification tablets this year and two years ago um and it was it's quite it was quite warm so I was and we and we used them um we just got water from various streams and put the put the tablets in. Um, it tastes slightly funny, but when you're thirsty, it's fine. And I, I put a bit of like energy drink in there as well. So you can't really, you don't really notice. Um, I have used the filter as well, but it takes quite a long time to, to squeeze it through to squeeze it through. And I have no patience anyway. So <laughs> Like, it's not your purpose <laughs> no it wasn't your purpose it <laughs> fell off the back of the bike so some some poor person hopefully has picked it up and is oh. enjoying the filter and it was like <laughs> cable tied on and it disappeared so we gave up with that but yeah I always take a few water purification tablets because then you've got they're they're tiny as well and they'll pack in your bag yeah I'd, um, I'd, I recently got um so one of those water filters it's called the catadin filter as a Christmas gift um, and I just tried that out a couple of weeks ago on a Bothy trip and that worked quite well and it's quite quick to push the water through so I just got some water from a stream and it's really easy to squeeze through and it packs down really small as well so you can fill in your actual water bottles and then put it away um, and then I also top that up with some chlorine tablets as well just to make sure um, you know um, that gets gets everything including the crypto from the sheep and all that sort of stuff mm. so yeah but mo- most um if, yeah, if I can get water from a reputable source, I'd prefer that. But it's always nice to have that backup on sort of a long trips through through remote areas. How about you, Lael? What's your usual water tactic? Do you just wing it? I just drink it. <laughs> Strong yeah, stomach. I, I just drink it. And, uh, you know, I've been doing that since 2015. I was riding from Alaska down through Canada to the start of uh, the Tour Divide. And I had one of those UV filters where it's like it lights up a different color when it's supposed to be pure. And then I thought, I don't think this is actually doing anything. So I shipped it home. And then since then, I've just drank the water. Um, but, you know, some of it doesn't taste great, but I'm just grateful to have water. And it's also part of, I don't know, there is something kind of empowering about doing that, um, that you're finding water from different sources and that this is natural. And of course, you just have to kind of trust your level of confidence of, of where you're getting the water from. Mostly in Europe, though, there are fountains everywhere, so it's not really a big deal there. Yeah, I think that um, as, a, as someone who's worked in water quite a lot um, and water treatment, yeah, it's, just, it's really about where you are. So if it's super remote and you don't see 
animals around like or like sheep and that sort of thing then maybe there's a bit more confidence but just be in the UK most places I've gone there's sheep um, everywhere and and you don't want to get crypto so it's yeah it's really about where you are and, and as Lael said just yeah trust the, knowing, knowing knowing that and, and trusting that and also if you're using a European water fountain make sure you look where the where water's actually going because I used one in Sospel in front of everyone when we were having lunch and filled my bottle and then walked around the corner and saw that there was like a first platform that it was coming off that was full of god knows what <laughs> <laughs> so yeah probably shouldn't have drunk that <laughs> the last thing you want to do is get ill on your trip um so yeah be sensible i guess oh this is a good one um not directly hygiene related but i think worth answering um any major bike packing tips for mega small frames i'm still struggling to come up with where to put everything um, I would use, I would consider using a rack and panniers actually um, in my, I'm, I'm not that, like I'm not small so I, I ride a 54 centimetre frame but um, my friends who are, who are small, you know, you can't, it's hard to get enough clearance between the saddle and the, and this, and the wheel for big seat packs and, and the, I think it changes the dynamic and the handling of the smaller bike more in some ways. And I'm a huge, like I was, I was touring before it was called bike packing with my panniers and, you know, when it was not very cool. And, and, and I, maybe people still think that about panniers, but I think they're great. And it's great because you can strap stuff to the top. So when I take the children, we always take, we always take panniers because I can get more in and at people's, you know, jackets and stuff you can put on the top and you can whip them out. But yeah, so I, I, I just always go for a rack and panniers. Yeah, I went back to Rack and Panniers for the first time last year and it was amazing. You could just shove everything in. It's like this huge void. <laughs> and then, of course, I took far too much and it was really difficult. <laughs> but yeah. It's great because you can open them up and you can see all the way in. And yeah. so when someone, when you've got a five-year-old going, I want my bear at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, oh, it's here. Shush now. You know, it's, it's ideal. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm aware that we're nearly out of time. Um, does anybody have any burning questions or anything that you'd like to cover that we haven't already mentioned? I know there's a little bit of saddle chat. Um, what saddles is everybody using? Obviously, it's very per down to very much personal preference. I feel like a lot of people say this, but the Mimic Specialized saddles, it's not what I was, I don't think I had it on the TNR, but um, I've been riding with it since it's incredible I swear it they have a bit of technology where there's a valley that mimics soft tissue I swear by it yeah I'm another mimicker although different saddles for different bikes um but yeah the Phenom which is the long-nosed one uh I'm a big fan of um so I've done the cell sometimes mentioned the cell Italia Lady Gel Diva, I did that for a while. I'm now try, trialing the um, special, the Mimic saddle as well. And I think it's just a little bit nicer, but I'm just trying to get the right width of it, width of it as well. Um, so yeah, it's quite an important thing if you having a saddle fit where you can just do it at home with a, if you Google a way of doing it, a cardboard and finding where your sit bones are and measuring that. Um, for me, I found getting the right width of saddle makes quite a big difference as well to how comfortable I'm feeling. Um, so yeah, worth worth um, checking out. Nice, yeah. Is it quite funny trying to measure your sit bones at home and actually making the indent on the cardboard, yeah. <laughs> filling down on the table? <laughs> <laughs> Wicked, yeah. I think with a lot of these things, like bike fit is so crucial. Like you want to give yourself the best chance to have the best time as you can on the bike. So if you're able to spend a little bit of money to get a bike fit, just to make sure that everything is like in the optimum position for you, then that's really, really useful. And hopefully should save you a bit of pain um, and discomfort in the long run. Lots of different um, suggestions in the messages there. Um, all sorts from Celia Italia to Brooks Leather. Uh, I heard that they sort of like grow or mold to your own shape, which is quite a good one. Pro Stealth Gravel Ergon. So yeah, it's, it's totally different for everyone, but um, 
lots of positive feedback about certain ones as well. I thought, Great. Uh, so I think we should probably. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, just maybe one more question, just whilst we've got uh, yeah, Phoebe sure. here. Um, somebody was asking about bike packing pregnant and if you'd ever like undertake a trip like this or maybe you have some like recommendations for like what would be like doable yeah I think it's really hard to know like it's really hard to predict how you're going to feel when you're pregnant so with my first pregnancy with my daughter so six six years ago I still raced through the first trimester and um and rode right the way through until maybe about a week or so before I gave birth um whereas this time I've just been violently sick for months for like four months and um have you know gradually wasted away <laughs> so it, you know it, you can't predict like how well you're gonna feel you you need to consider the fact that you, you won't be able to perhaps manage what you did before. There's no reason why you can't ride your bike and do all the things you did before, but you just need to be a bit kinder to yourself because you won't have the same energy levels. The, the first trimester, you know, saps all your energy. And then the middle bit is probably the best bit. So if you were going to plan a trip, you kind of want your, your, your middle, middle, your second trimester is probably the best time um, to go anywhere. And yeah, I just, you could definitely bike pack that's not a problem just just be mindful that sometimes you just need to be a bit nicer to yourself I, I get intensely frustrated that I can't always do what I did before but I, you know I can ride for a good two hours two two and a half hours and then I need a, a nice sit down and a rest and everything needs to stretch out and I just and then I could probably maybe manage another hour or so um but I wouldn't be able to ride all day I'm just starting my third trimester now so the trips and bike riding is definitely still doable. Gabby also rode through her two pregnancies. Um, yeah, there's not, not much stopping you, is there, Gabby? <laughs> I found it was like the one thing I could do, actually. I always, I tried to do other things. Like I ran for a bit and everyone told me how amazing swimming would feel. Um, but for me, I just felt so comfortable on my bike. And I think also it was just the thing that made me feel like myself. Um, just getting out for an hour or like however long um and I did like gradually tweak my bike more and more throughout my pregnancy but yeah I was still pedaling on the day both of my kids were born <laughs> and it was yeah it was great like a lifesaver <laughs> but yeah I think it's just if you feel comfortable and you're enjoying it then yeah continue but if it's uncomfortable then also you have to listen to your body Wicked. Well, thank you so much to Phoebe, Vera, Nick and Lael for joining us. Thank you all for coming along as well and for all your really great questions. I've certainly learned loads and I have a little shopping list now ready for my 2022 bikepacking adventures. Looking forward to being a little bit less stinky than uh, usual. <laughs> Um, if you can join us tomorrow night, we're going to be back with another panel talking all things, um, preparing for your bikepacking adventures, all the practical side of things, what to pack, what kind of kit to take. Um, so Gabby will share uh, a link to that one as well. I uh, hope you can join us and thank you very much for joining. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a lovely evening. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.